Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being with us at this time. We've got a very special subject that we've been covering in some detail for actually a long period of time. Our topic is, as it has been in the past, Roman Catholicism. I know this is a topic that touches a lot of people's lives. They either are one, or they know someone that's one, or have friends or whatever. But if, you've, if you are one, we want you to know that as we go through the show, we, we're not on some kind of hatred campaign or anything like that. We simply are outlining differences between Roman Catholicism and what we be, believe to be Biblical Christianity. Well, joining me in this endeavor, and by the way, uh, the name of this particular program dealing with Roman Catholicism is Roman Catholic Apologist Part 2. Now, I know a lot of people are going, uh, what apologist? What, what's that? We'll explain that in a minute, but first, I'd like to introduce my guest, Rob Zins. Rob, good to have you here as usual in this series. Thank you. My pleasure. Pleasure yeah. to be here. We've, uh, we've done quite a few shows already. I hope our viewers are uh, uh, knowledgeable about some of the shows we've done in the past. Or I guess what this would be show number, uh, what do you think, uh, number 10 now? Uh, probably. It seems like we've worked together for quite some time. <laughs> uh, hopefully we are uh, making a dent in the material and uh, people are beginning to appreciate the differences between biblical Christianity and the Roman Catholic religion. Well, Roman Catholicism is such a vast topic yes, in itself. It, it almost takes masses of shows just to be able to bring out the many differences on all kinds of levels. Did I hear you say masses of shows? <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was, he's getting a little punchy, folks, here. Uh, <laughs> we've been doing quite a few shows. But that was uh, the, no, no offense intended to our uh, viewing audience. Right. In fact, Rob, I'd like you to take a moment, explain who you are, and the reason we're doing things such as this, and then tie it in with uh, Roman Catholic apologists, and explain that term also. Well, an apologist is one who is uh, simply a defender of something. And in this case, uh, an apologist uh, such as myself would be a defender of biblical Christianity. And when I say biblical Christianity, I mean that with all sincerity, that uh, I defend the proposition that the Bible alone is a sole source of authority in matters pertaining to the gospel and to the revealed will of God. And uh, in traveling the nation and speaking at debates, symposiums, and giving conferences, it has been my labor to show forth that the Bible and the gospel contained in it contradicts and is inimical to the Roman Catholic religion, this uh, system of salvation that has grown over the centuries and which has incorporated literally millions uh, on the planet Earth. Yeah, but it's and just another Christian system. Well, that's what they would like you to think, another Christian system. But when you begin to define the term Christian and get it down to brass tacks, what is Christianity? What gives one the right to call himself or herself a Christian? Then we're going to find that there are two different gospels at work here. They both can't be true. They both can't be right. Indeed, they are not both right. And it's part of uh, my job in keeping with the responsibility as a biblical Christian, as one who has received the gospel of Christ and has believed in the simplicity of that gospel, to defend it against the intrusion and against the erosion of all systems, including the Roman system, that uh, seeks to obscure it or to uh, in any way uh, uh, to take away from the simplicity of the gospel. Now, I might add that the Roman Catholic religion is not the only religion that claims to have specific and, uh, and uh, authoritative truth in matters of faith and in matters of the gospel. And there are many other religions that claim this type of specified truth, many other religions which claim to have uh, special revelation from God, there are many hierarchical religions that claim to be the uh, leader of uh, the witness for Jesus Christ. And as these religions have emerged throughout the centuries, they have been tried and tested by the Word of God. 
and uh, as in the case of Roman Catholicism, they have been found wanting, and uh, throughout the centuries, God has raised up his people to stand up and say, thus saith the word, in contradistinction to systems, such as the Roman yeah, Catholic. Somebody out there would say, well, who are you? What, who gives you the authority to get on TV and do stuff like this? And who, where did you get your authority to do such a thing? You know, I mean, I know a lot of these religions and things, these systems have a hierarchical, you know, they have a hierarchy that uh, has some kind of power or authority associated with it. Who are you? Well, that's a good question. And my answer would be that uh, if I had authority, it would be an authority derived from men, and in which case it would be spurious authority. So I claim no authority. I claim only the authority of the Word of God. As the Word of God is revealed, as the Bible tests all things, that in itself is authority enough. So I take the scripture, and I would encourage uh, any Roman Catholic listeners to notice that uh, I'm holding up a Roman Catholic Bible. A Douay Rheims. A Douay Rheims version of the Roman Catholic Bible. And uh, I say that the authority is in the Bible. And this Bible is readable, and it is understandable by those uh, whom God chooses to reveal himself to in the sense of the uh, Christian man, Christian woman, Christian teenager. Uh, of course, those who deny the authority of Scripture, those who deny the incarnation of Christ, those who deny the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, would uh, not be able to understand this. They would not be able to uh, have a, a, a knowledge of the gospel, and that's what apologetics is about, to stand up and say, well, thus saith the word. Now, uh, some of you out there may say, well, you've said a mouthful. You said that you are the one that can interpret the Bible. I have a pope that's much greater than you, and he can interpret the Bible. Why should I believe you and not my pope? Well, my answer to that is, look for yourself. You're responsible for opening the scriptures. You're responsible for looking into the Word of God. You're responsible for finding whether or not the dogmas of the Roman Catholic religion or any other religion are accurate because the scripture is the final authority on it. So in the work that I do, I appeal to the scriptures. If it can be validated from the word of God, then it can be said to have been given to us from God himself. If it cannot be validated, then it's spurious, it's the work of men, and all those who rally around it are arriving at their authority from men. Now, there's been the accusation that makes everybody in the world an authority on the Bible, and each person does what's right in his own mind. I don't believe that for a moment. I believe that God has given to us his very own spirit, wherein he has enabled those uh, Christians that he has called out from eternity past and called uh, from century to century to understand the basic truths of the gospel. And there's, uh, there is confirmation century after century, year after year, of men and women who have been saved by the grace of God who proclaim the same gospel. So it's not like I have the Bible, I interpret it my own way, you have the Bible, you interpret it your own way. Not at all. It's that the Bible speaks plainly to these issues and we embrace it. Okay, now, you said a, a lot there. Right. Uh, we're, the, the name of the show is Roman Catholic Apologists, people who defend the Roman Catholic religion, mm -hmm. I would suppose, against people like you who would be coming against it and saying it's not a true religion, it's a false religion, and if you believe it, you'll go to hell. Mm -hmm. And likewise, Roman Catholic Apologists, who are equally concerned, generally, about other people's welfare, believe that if they don't join a Catholic church, then they might lose your salvation or something of that nature. Exactly. So uh, you engage in debates, uh, they engage in debates, uh, there's there's quite a, uh, a lot of activity, I suppose, going on out there right now. Yes, there in is. In fact, you have something on your lap there that uh, you don't have to read the whole thing, but you might want to pick a few phrases out there, maybe hold up to our viewers, and maybe explain what that uh, paper is there that you have, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about this and how it relates with Roman Catholic apologists. This is a, a, a letter written by an organization called Keep the Faith Incorporated uh, out of New Jersey. The author is a self-described uh, uh, Roman uh, Catholic uh, apologist of sorts, 
and he has founded this organization, Keep the Faith. And the letter uh, is written and sent out to a number of Roman Catholic priests in the Northeast, uh, in particular New England, New Jersey area, and uh, it is identified in this manner. Keep the Faith is a lay apostolate dedicated to the defense of Orthodox Roman Catholicism. We would like to express our concern about one of the most serious threats to the faith today, the Evangelical Bible Christian Movement. As you are no doubt painfully aware, Catholics are leaving the church in droves to join non-denominational Protestant Bible chapels where they are indoctrinated in the heresy of salvation by faith alone without need of the church, the priesthood, or the sacraments. So you, you can see... Can you show that, that, hold that up for a second right, to this, the viewer just to let them have a quick look at that? Right, this, right uh, here. this uh, letter right here... That's a, that's a out, mass mail-out thing. Mass mail-out, and it was sent to, uh, as far as I know, every priest in the state of Vermont got a copy of this letter. Oh. And it's promoting a number of tapes on how to answer Bible church Bible chapel, uh, what he calls uh, evangelical Bible Christian movement type people. So the Roman Catholic Church is busy protecting their people against what they call the heresy of salvation by faith alone without need of the church, the priesthood, or the sacrament. That reminds me of something else, too. You've got a book here, I think, called uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism or something right. like that. While we're on the subject, there... We're going to just show what the Roman Catholic apologists have uh, been up to. They're not sleeping. This is a, a book that has become uh, quite popular in Roman Catholic circles, printed in 1988 by Ignatius Press and authored by Carl Keating. This book, entitled Catholicism and Fundamentalism, The Attack on Romanism by Bible Christians, is probably the most popular textbook today for Roman Catholic seminaries, Roman Catholic graduate students, priests, lay apologists, uh, you name it, Catholic theologians of all sorts have really rallied around this book in trying to uh, get their people to rally around the Roman Catholic religion. And uh, I, I get a kick out of the endorsement on the back by one of the uh, fellows that wants to endorse this book. He writes, I strongly advise honest fundamentalist not to read this book. They might find their whole position collapsing in ruins. So the challenge has gone out, I mm -hmm. would say, or well, the challenge has always been there, though, has it not, Larry? Mm -hmm. We consider the uh, Reformation of the 16th century, we consider the, uh, the uh, men and women who have given their lives over the centuries to protect the gospel, to stand up against heresy, stand up against error, and it's nothing new for uh, Now, this God Carl to... Keating's written this book. Does he do, is he associated with a group? Uh, I think he I've is. heard of Catholic Answers. Do they put out tracts? Are they doing seminars? Oh, my. Or? Catholic Answers uh, is a tremendously popular lay organization of the Roman Catholic religion, and they are uh, uh, very, very much active in their writing and they're speaking, they debate all over the nation, they publish a monthly magazine called This Rock, and they are on the cutting edge protecting the Roman Catholic religion so now against when, the inroads. Here's the Roman Catholic uh, people doing apologetics to right. defend their faith, Exactly. yet uh, I've heard in previous shows we've played and things, uh, some people don't seem to appreciate you, on the other hand, presenting biblical apologetics to defend your faith. In other words, I almost see a double standard, whereas one group is promoting their side with apologetics, but then it's like, you're, you're a bad guy <laughs> if you do the, the same thing they're doing, except from the other side. Well, there's some confusion in the, uh, the body of Christ today. When I speak of the body of Christ, I mean Bible-believing, born-again Christians, evangelicals, many titles that we've been given, but essentially those who hold the sola fide for salvation, sola faith, faith only, sola scriptura for authority, the Bible alone for authority. There's a lot of confusion out there because the Roman Catholic religion has made some presentations, has made some overtures. They have uh, 
been aggressively involved in the ecumenical movement, in the social issues, and uh, I think that uh, Bible-believing Christians and, and Bible chapels and independent fundamentalist churches and Baptist churches and so forth and so on are beginning to wake up and realize that these people, these Romanists, these Roman Catholics, these apologists, apologists are, are, are aggressive They're coming in their after efforts mm -hmm. to come after people. They're aggressive in their efforts to convert people to Catholicism, and they are even more aggressive in protecting the Roman Catholic religion against what they call Bible-thumping Christians. So the, uh, the battle lines are being renewed and redrawn, and uh, they're which old is, battle lines. Which is something you don't really object to, because it starts to show the, the differences. Absolutely. Not at all. Which is what a lot of people uh, have always thought, well, what's the difference? But now... Yeah. Both sides are drawing up those battle lines, yes, and people can see. So from that letter you read a minute ago, it sounded like he was saying it's a heresy. And I think he goes on in the letter to really kind of blast people that take the Bible literally or seriously, or, you know, right. the Bible. Well, the Bible Christians. alone as a source of authority, and the only source of authority, is a, it's a heresy in the Roman Catholic religion. And so they, they, they would almost anathematize, which is the to damn, basically, or condemn, condemn. the Bible. Believe. Now, let me, just with that thought, let me just read something to our viewers out there. I've got right here a Catholic encyclopedia. I got it at the Catholic bookstore. It's revised and updated, over 4,000 updated articles that clarify Catholic beliefs. It says on the back, it's authoritative, comprehensive, and current. And uh, it's, it's pretty thick and everything, but I... I wanted to bring in what we were just talking about there, mm -hmm. about Bible Christians, Bible thumpers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading something here on the statement it has in the Catholic Encyclopedia about Muslims. It says, Muslims are followers of Mohammedan, Mohammedanism. Uh, Vatican II declares, upon the Muslims, the church looks with esteem. They adore one God, living and enduring, merciful and all-powerful, maker of heaven and earth, and speaker to men. They strive to submit wholeheartedly even to his inscrutable decrees, just as did Abraham, with whom the Islamic faith is pleased to associate itself. Though they do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as God, they revere him as a prophet. They also honor Mary, his virgin mother. At times they call on her, too, with devotion. And it goes on here uh, saying some other nice things about Islam. Mm. And, the, and the Muslims. Mm. And, and this is a quote out of Vatican II, mm. which I think is uh, pretty authoritative. Mm. Now what, what, I guess it's just a contradiction in my mind. I'm going, how is it these Roman Catholic apologists are blasting, quote, Bible Christians, end quote, and yet we have uh, their encyclopedias and Vatican II itself saying, well, we look with esteem on the Muslims who they don't. They deny the Trinity. Mm -hmm. They they don't believe Jesus is God. Uh, they deny the the personality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, almost every Christian essential doctrine or cardinal doctrine is denied. If you read the Quran, in fact, I can't resist just for the moment. If anybody needs some good information on mm -hmm. Islam, uh, this is one of the best books I've seen on it. Islam Unveiled: A True Desert Storm by Dr. Robert A. Mori. Anyone who wants information on this, you'll get some. <laughs> incredible information on Quran, uh, Muhammad, and, uh, and Allah. Uh, things that would just absolutely uh, blow your mind, mm. basically. But what, I, what it comes down to is here's a religion that's almost, you can easily say, antichrist, and yet in their own Vatican II and their encyclopedias, they look upon this religion with esteem. Now, how is it possible? How, you, are, you are coming from the Bible, and you're mm -hmm. in this terrible heresy, Mm -hmm. Yet here's these other people that deny almost every cardinal Christian uh, doctrine, and yet they're looked upon with esteem by the Catholic Church. How does that work out? I can't say how the Roman Catholic religion could accept uh, the faith of the Muslim, but I can say that, that uh, in, in doing so, they, they show their hand. They know that Bible alone, Christian, people such as you and such as me are, are a threat to them because we'll stand up. We'll say no. We'll say no to the Mass. We'll say no to the efficaciousness of baptism. We'll say no to the hierarchical system. We'll say no to the Pope. Not only will we say no, but we will take their own Bibles 
such as I have today, the Douay Rheims version of the Bible, and we'll go to Catholic people and we'll say, now look, you claim this is the authority written from God, and I want to show you where your own system is wrong. And that's a danger. That's a threat to the Catholic religion because you're using what they esteem highly mm -hmm. to prove their own system to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as it is, uh, nothing new in the history of the, the body of Christ, um, Satan is repulsed by those who hold to the truth. And uh, the ecumenical movement, I think, speaks for itself. Strange bedfellows, but no danger. The danger is when you can take the Bible into the Catholic community and begin mm -hmm. preaching the Word and teaching sola fide, sola scriptura, then it becomes ultimately dangerous. That's why we are looked at by the Catholic community as rank heretics, and they can accept something like the Muslim now, for their own purposes. Now, what we're going to show in this particular program, as I said, this is Roman Catholic Apologist Part 2, and what we did in Part 1 is we showed actual debate footage of Rob here debating against a Dr. Art Sippo, who is a Roman Catholic theologian, uh, mm -hmm. I think an able uh, representative of their faith. Able defender, yes. And uh, uh, we showed clips from that debate in part one, and now here in part two we're going to show you some actual debate footage from a second debate you had with Dr. Sippo uh, on the subject of baptism. Yes. And uh, our viewers will get a treat there and, and be able to watch that, but what I'd like to do is uh, just clarify a couple of points with a chart. Uh, Get the chart up here. I'll just bring it right up. This gets us back to something we were talking about before. Uh, it gets into uh, these decrees of, uh, you know, ec ecumenism. Mm -hmm. And you find it down and through here. Uh, a lot of this is espoused by Vatican II, which we mentioned a minute ago about mm -hmm. the Muslims. And uh, Rob, would you care to make a few comments about the importance of baptism in a Roman Catholic scheme of things? Well, the Roman Catholic religion has a number of pillars, but none more important than the doctrine of baptism. The Roman Catholic religion believes that baptism itself is efficacious. That is, the waters of baptism perform a supernatural act upon the recipient whereby sin is washed away. Now, this sin that is washed away in the Roman Catholic religion is the original sin, the original pollution of Adam, which is passed down to Adam's uh, progeny. And for years and years, the Roman Catholic religion maintained that one had to be baptized in the Roman Catholic religion to have any hope of salvation, because that was the only proper and true baptism there was. Well, when I debated Dr. Sippo, and you'll see it on the tape, you'll see that uh, the crux of, uh, uh, of their understanding of baptism is found in their interpretation of the third chapter of the book of John, specifically John chapter 3, verse 5. But the whole context of the third chapter of John is extremely important. And you'll see some footage in this debate of Dr. Sippo's treatment of John chapter 3, and then my treatment of John chapter 3. And the, the two are absolutely opposite from each other. The Roman Catholic theologian believes and teaches his people that baptism is the meaning of John chapter 3, and that the waters of baptism are what essentially regenerates a person, brings them into the, uh, the uh, a a relationship with God, and baptism thus becomes the key element in their sacramental system. But I have noticed here on the Roman Catholic decrees of ecumenism from Vatican II that baptism, i just read this to you, it says, by the sacrament of baptism, whenever it is properly conferred in the way the Lord determined. Now that would be Roman Catholic understanding of baptism, whenever it is properly conferred in the way the Lord determined and received with the appropriate disposition of soul, a man becomes truly incorporated into the crucified and glorified Christ and is reborn to a sharing of the divine life. Baptism, therefore, constitutes a sacramental bond of unity 
linking all who have been reborn by means of it. Baptism is thus oriented toward a complete profession of faith, a complete incorporation in the Roman Catholic system of salvation as Christ willed it to be, and finally toward a complete participation in the Eucharist, Mass, Communion, the, ecclesia, the ecclesial communities, Protestants, separated from us, lack that fullness of unity with us which should flow from baptism, and therefore our separated brethren, especially because of the lack of the sacrament of orders, priest and pope, and they have not preserved the genuine and total reality of the Eucharistic mystery. Now what this is saying here, Larry, is that the Roman Catholic religion is willing to accept the baptism of other religions, providing the baptism of other religions were performed in the same spirit, in the same meaning, in the same understanding as Roman Catholic baptism. So there's a bridge here whereby Rome is calling back what she calls separated brethren through the acceptance of baptisms. So if you're Presbyterian, or if you're Lutheran, or if you're Episcopalian, or if you're other Pado baptist child Baptist, uh, uh, or efficacious Baptist organizations, uh, denominations, you can be, be thankful that the Mother Church, the quote Roman Catholic Church, will now receive that baptism as being a portion of the truth of, uh, of uh, salvation, and they will treat it as a sacrament, providing you, in administering it, had that understanding in the administration of it. And it's building an important bridge in this whole ecumenical movement, but it's not Rome changing, it's Rome finding a way to bring people into her using this uh, doctrine of baptism. For the Roman Catholic religion to be born again is to be baptized. To be regenerated is to be baptized. Baptism is regeneration in the Roman Catholic system. And that's why it is absolutely critical that we draw the line right there and say, no, baptism is not efficacious. It is not a sacrament which regenerates the recipient. Baptism does not have that meaning, and they have twisted the scriptures, and they have abused the scriptures to, uh, to the point of no return in their system to elevate baptism to uh, that type of meaning. I see. Very well said there, brother. Just looking at this chart also, we had a few more statements here by uh, some of the popes and things. I, I see here Pope Paul VI has written, finally confirmation is so closely linked with the Holy Eucharist that the faithful, after being sealed by holy baptism and confirmation, are incorporated fully in the body of Christ by participation in the Eucharist. So apparently, as we have this, in these bigger words here, if the camera picks up, you don't have a fullness of salvation until you go ahead and get in with the confirmation, the Eucharist, uh, and, and these other things, uh, I guess the sacraments mm -hmm. of the Roman Catholic Church. And I guess, like it says here, this is the Roman road of salvation. <laughs> Right. <laughs> In a right. different and it's not sense. the book of Romans. It <laughs> right. is on the road to Rome. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, as we've done in a previous show, we've shown that uh, if you follow this, what they really are looking at is they want you to come back to the Roman system. Exactly. And then if you take their oath, if you join their church, you have to basically deny all the Protestant beliefs that you formerly held exactly. and embrace everything that they teach. Exactly. So I don't really see a whole lot of ecumenism here because they're, uh, once they get you, they tell you to deny everything else. We've got, the, right. we've got their oath for converts on the other side of this chart, but time is flying and right. we don't have it. It was on a previous show if you're interested in finding mm -hmm. out more about that. But uh, Rob, time's flying on us here as I just said. We, we're going to go ahead and get into the debate footage and then we'll come back and have a few more things to say before the show signs off. So right. folks out there, just sit back, get ready for some, uh, I, I guess I should say, theological jousting and dueling. Yes. <laughs> and we'll just see what happens. All right. All right. Thank you. We're in Titus 3.5. The, which is one of the uh, most treasured passages of all Protestant theologians, says this, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. We attribute 
the regeneration and renewing to the Holy Spirit, not to water and not to baptism. You have to import to that passage water and baptism. And yet you see here that regeneration and renewing are connected by a chi and refer to the same content of thought by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by grace by his grace we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life so yes it's true when we come to Titus 3 5 and 6 we treasure it we view it entirely differently we see the washing and the sanctification as the sovereign work of the Spirit of God that has nothing to do with baptism infant or otherwise if the Spirit is the agent and the Spirit is doing this and the Spirit is responsible for this where is the water where is the efficacy of the water in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, if it's not imported? The water does nothing. The spirit does everything, period. And that's what we've been saying all along. The water is a symbol which in the proper form God has promised to imbue with his spirit. The problem that we've got here, Rob, you've got two baptisms. You've got a spirit baptism and you've got a water baptism. And St. Paul says in Ephesians 4, there's only one. What I'm saying is the one baptism that we have, the only baptism that we are supposed to believe according to the Bible, appears to be the water baptism that our Lord and Savior instituted and that he left this earth telling us everybody should submit themselves to. I think that what has happened here is it is sitting right in front of you and you can't see it. There are none so blind as those who will not to see. There's only one baptism, and the baptism comes with the Spirit. The Spirit descended when Jesus was baptized. We're told that the Spirit descends on us in baptism, in St. Paul. What else do we have to say? How clear does the Bible have to get? It is extremely clear that there's only one baptism, and that God has promised His Spirit to it, and that Spirit will be in the body of the church. And I remind you that it talks here about we were all given one spirit to drink, or another water image. And there are numerous water images that go throughout this area, linking the spirit to water and water to the spirit. It's an Old Testament image. Now, we don't have to import this idea from elsewhere. If we go back to the original texts, that's what's there, water and spirit, because it is the spirit over the water that gives life. That's how life was created according to Genesis. That's how life was recreated after the flood. That's the whole point. Water is the principle of life and the spirit comes with it. That's why we were given the sacrament of baptism as the first plank, if you will, in the sacramental system that Jesus founded, which began with baptism and went through various other symbolic signs and culminated in the Eucharist, which was connected intimately with his death on the cross. That whole thing is intertwined and interlinked. Two minutes. Well, you maintain that I have a problem because I have two baptisms, and uh, it's a problem I want to have, believe me, because it's a problem that's scriptural. And I want to have a scriptural problem. We're told in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. If that's not a distinction between water and spirit, I don't know what is. We're also told again in Acts chapter 11 in verse 16, Peter recounting how the Lord had worked earlier says, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now here we have another contrast between water baptism and spirit baptism. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. No water. No water whatsoever. If I were to turn again to uh, Acts chapter 10, 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message, and all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. And then he says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit. Spirit, then water. As a matter of fact, we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to quote it for you, that we are sealed until the day of redemption. He says, Paul says, in Christ you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. That's right. And it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we are baptized into Christ by that baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we show forth it, picture it, in the waters of believer baptism. You're going to have to help me in this one, Bob. Yes. Where is it in Acts where they came across the disciples of John who had been baptized and then they re-baptized them in the name of Jesus? That'd be Acts chapter 20. Okay. Re-water baptized them. In other words, if it was merely a washing with water to repentance and they'd had it from John and then they got religion, they wouldn't have needed to be re-baptized in water. End of answer. The passage is Acts 19, I'm sorry, it wasn't okay. Acts 20. And it came about that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No. We have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. That's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. You have to be baptized into Christ. So they were baptized into Christ. And when they were baptized into Christ, they received the Holy Spirit. But the point is, is that they had not, not received the Holy Spirit because they were baptized improperly. It's because they were not baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. No, I, I think I've said enough on that one. Nothing more need be said. <laughs> what I'm asking is, on the basis of Sola Scriptura, if Sola Scriptura can actually be seen to be God's way of theological discernment, so that God has equipped us with the Scriptures alone, that we can determine the truth in this matter, why is it that even those among your co-religionists, if you will, or I should say among other Protestants, why is it that Sola Scriptura has not allowed them to discern the same thing that you've discerned? Is there a problem here with an inadequate method of theological discernment? I can answer that with a citation from T.E. Watson's book entitled, Should Infants Be Baptized? He quotes one of the most prominent Protestant theologians ever to write in America, a strong and true dyed-in-the-wool Presbyterian theologian whom I admire greatly. His name is B.P. Warfield. And in his Studies in Theology, page 399, we hear this. It is true that there is no express command to baptize infants in the New Testament, no express record of the baptism of infants, and no passages so stringently implying it that we must infer from them that infants were baptized. That's a Presbyterian theologian admitting the point. They admit the point that there is no command to baptize infants, no express record of the baptism of infants, and no passages stringently implying that we must baptize infants. So why then do Protestant denominations baptize infants? They do so on the basis of the covenant argument that you have been expressing. But the difference between a Presbyterian infant baptism or a Methodist infant baptism or an Anglican infant baptism, although I'm not certain about Anglicanism, is, is that when they baptize an infant, they merely say that he is baptized into the new covenant. They would never say that that baptism 
is efficacious for the remission of original sin. Therefore, the Protestant community stands united against the Roman Catholic efficacious position, although it is divided as to whether or not, by virtue of covenant relationship, infants should be baptized. And as far as the diversity among us, there has been diversity on this issue and this question since our Lord Jesus Christ left this earth. And the diversity comes from historic theologians as well as modern theologians. To say that the Roman Catholic Church has the only answer to this and has, has been held since antiquity is overstating the case. Many of the church fathers do not, in fact, hold to infant baptism, and it was not introduced until late in Roman Catholic history. Even those church fathers, such as Ambrose and Chrysostom, who said it might be a good idea to wait until children are older before you baptize them, would baptize their children when they were in danger of death. And that is very clear in Tertullian's uh, book on baptism. And that is one major difference. And the reason they believed it is because baptism was necessary for salvation. And Tertullian quotes John 3, 5. It's, and that's, that's a standard practice. Uh, you can go and look that up if, if you will. That is a major difference. You can't go superficially on the fact that they might think it's best to wait until later. Because they definitely baptized children in danger of death. Yes, my comment is that if we consider Dionysius... 95 AD, the Epistle of Barnabas, 125 AD, the Shepherd of Hermas, 150 AD, Ignatius, 107, Clement of Rome, 100, along with Melito, Polycarp, Theophilus, Athenagoras, none of them baptized infants, and there is no, not one shred of evidence from the earliest church fathers that this was a practice of the church. It came into vogue, came into practice, uh, perhaps 200 to 250 AD, have 250 years where it was not a practice and it grew in prominence and it was still a divisive issue with many of the church fathers arguing and bickering whether or not it should be or should not be practiced. What I said was that in John 3 verse 5 and following is that our Lord is developing a contrast between that which is born of the Spirit, produced by the Spirit, that which comes from, is begotten by the Spirit, and that which is begotten by the flesh. The flesh does not beget that which is spiritual. Only the spiritual begets that which is spiritual. And my point here was to cite verse 6 of John chapter 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And this is the contrast that Christ is giving to Nicodemus in the context of what it means to be born from above. For us to be born from above means that God has to do the work. First Corinthians chapter 1, by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. It is the supernatural work of God which brings about the changed heart, the changed person in so far as being born from above his concern. And this is part and partial to salvation. Nothing we can do in the flesh can arrive at this. Nothing physical can arrive at this. God has not endowed the waters of baptism with authority, neither has he made baptism the issue from which the Spirit will direct regeneration. That's the whole point of the debate. I was not at all trying to say anything contrary or otherwise to the incarnation, and that's how I'd answer that. Okay. Well, I think your answer, though, outlines the real problem here, because you are identifying the term flesh with, if you will, the material world, and spirit, if you will, with God's world. Um, and I think that that's a serious misrepresentation of the text. The term flesh is generally used for, it's, it's generally used for sarks, the sinful nature of the flesh. Now even though this is John's Gospel, I, I, and not Paul, where this classically is demonstrated, there is a distinction. It's not the same. Uh, when it says that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, it's saying that which comes from the sinful desires of man, from the sinful
sinfulness of man is sinful. Uh, but it is not saying that that which comes from the material world is all sinful. And I would make a distinction in this notion of what is spiritual. And the same mistake is made by Protestants interpreting John 6, where it talks about how you've got to worship in spirit and truth. Worshiping in spirit does not mean ethereally, in your mind, immaterially. The Spirit of God moved upon the waters and brought forth life. The Spirit of God is in the world. The world is a good place. God is good. He is pointed to by the world. Paul tells us that the power and glory of God, his goodness is made manifest in the world. You've got to understand that the spiritual is not the immaterial. It means that which proceeds from the Spirit of God. And all that proceeds from the Spirit of God is not necessarily, quote, immaterial spirit. Some of it is the good of the material world. And I would say this, this is a, a problem that I see some confusion in Protestant theology with, getting too much of the flesh uh, confused with the body, if you will, and not recognizing that spirit and body sometimes are referring to the same thing. Okay, the spirit is referring to the goodness of the, of the material creation that is brought about by the Spirit of God. The flesh is the part that's evil, and that comes from the evil heart of man, fallen man, man who has chosen to sin. All right. The second question uh, is actually a combination of the two to you, Dr. Sippo, that addresses the idea of, that the Catholic actually uh, expresses several ideas about baptism. Do, don't, doesn't the Catholic Church teach other ways of baptism besides water such as desire? Um, aside from frank water baptism, the Church recognizes two other modes of baptism. All right, Baptism of desire and baptism of blood. We do not consider them to be separate from the sacrament. Rather, they are the baptism of desire we will start with first is where an individual longs for baptism but dies before being able to achieve it now i make a distinction here between the idea of being regenerate merely by faith and uh, being regenerate by desiring baptism the baptism of desire only is efficacious if you die desiring baptism and are unable to obtain it. And it is our belief that a gracious God grants you that grace on the basis of his graciousness because you were seeking it. The classic example probably of baptism of desire is the good thief on the cross who didn't actually have the chance to get dunked all the way under the water and probably only by his confession of faith on the cross and his realization of who Jesus was was he able to come to salvation and he's the only one in the New Testament we know for sure is in heaven because Jesus told himself so. okay he desired it but he died before he achieved it baptism of blood is like unto baptism of desire in that an individual dies okay for the faith and the classic example of that is referred to the holy innocents those who died in Bethlehem, the babies who were killed when Herod was searching for Christ. They were killed because of Jesus. And in essence, their death was a martyr's death for Jesus. Uh, the same thing is true of the martyrs in the Colosseum. It was well known in those eras that people seeing the martyrs in the Colosseum were so moved by seeing them that they would leap out into the stadium to die along with them because they figured they must have something if they can suffer these penalties. And that's really what it was meant to entail. But the operative word in there is die, okay? you got to die seeking baptism. And that's the only way uh, that uh, you, outside of water baptism, that you can receive the regeneration of Christ in our understanding. Now, there has been a theory put forward by a Father Willis uh, to deal with uh, unbaptized infants, which has been called the baptism of the resurrection, uh, which is a third one. It is an extreme minority opinion, uh, but basically what he teaches is that at the time of the resurrection, when Jesus, as the new Adam, calls in all the, be all the human beings of the world, those that do not resist him are resurrected into new life. Okay, because sin is the resistance against God. As such, infants who die in no sin will not resist the will of God, and they will be resurrected into the new Adam and go to heaven. Makes sense. That is a minority opinion and not really officially sanctioned, but the other two are. Robert. In the first chapter of John, 
we're giving a little bit of information about what it means to be regenerate and what it means to be born from a monergistic perspective that is born of God. Very similar to the John 3, 5 passage. I'm not trying to show a, a strict dichotomy between flesh being evil and spirit being spiritual. I'm simply pointing out, and I'll reiterate, that in John 3, 5 and following, our Lord is showing a distinction between that which is born of flesh. He doesn't even have to say that which is evil flesh, just that which is flesh, flesh and blood, and that which is born of the Spirit, of the Spirit of God. You have been born of the flesh. You have been born by virtue of being a human being. You were a baby. You grew up born of the flesh. But unless you are born of the Spirit, born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, who are those who are born from above? Are those who are, who are they? We're told, I think, in John chapter 1 who they are. Well, we're told in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you're counting on yourself as being a child of God because you were born of blood, or you're born of flesh, or you're born of the will of man, you've got it all wrong. If you're counting on yourself to be a child of God because you were born and baptized, you've got it all wrong. You have to be born of God. And that being born of God is the work of the Spirit of God. We cannot beget it. We cannot make it happen. We cannot transform somebody. Only God can do it. And he does it sovereignly. He does it by virtue of his Spirit. And it is not linked to water. It is linked to his everlasting will. And he brings it about according to a sovereign design. It does not necessarily need to be linked with water. Well, there you have it, folks. An actual debate between two theologians on, I think, a very significant and important doctrine pertaining to uh, the question of baptism. I mean, do you have to be water baptized in order to be saved? Is that essential for your salvation? I think this all ties in with the, the sacramental system, the importance of it. Uh, I, I can see when you're debating with Roman Catholic theologians, it's like something they are not going to let go of no matter what happens. You know, if they have to invent another doctrine <laughs> to try to cover a point, they'll come up with it. You know? mm -hmm. well, well, do you have anything to say about that, uh, the sacramental system? I know our chart up here gets into all seven sacraments, and right before we went to the debate footage, you were saying how that's one of the most important things in the sacramental system. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of understanding the Roman Catholic religion, is to understand that it is a religion of sacraments. It's a religion based upon uh, man doing something in order to to have something happen to him internally. And the, the whole idea behind the Roman Catholic religion is that if I participate in the sacramental system, then I'm walking up the stairway to heaven or I'm working my way into a relationship with God because in each sacrament, grace is said to be given by God for the next step. That's what makes baptism such a tremendous pillar of the Roman Catholic religion. They have to have it because that's the starting point. And of course, that's how we call uh, Romanism a religion from the cradle to the grave because the very first sacrament is baptism and the last is extreme unction. So right from the very beginning, the Roman Catholic mother and father is said, you must get that baby baptized. You must get that water poured on him. If you don't, then you can't wash away that original sin. And if you don't, then you can't get that grace infused which regenerates you. And if you're not regenerated, then you're not ready for the next step, which is confirmation or communion. So let's so take forth. a group like the Quakers or the Salvation Army who don't believe in baptism. Right. So are they damned to hell right Absolutely. off the bat? Absolutely. There's no way, no way possible that those people can have the original sin of Adam washed away without the waters of baptism. 
Well, and when you point out that John 3, 5 does not teach that at all, uh, well, their, their answer is, uh, well, of course it does. And Well, who said so? Well, this has been the teaching of the church. Well, take a look at it, man. Just read it in context. And uh, the answer always comes back, well, the church has understood it this way. And who are you to argue with it, you see? And, and that's where we have this tension. It almost, it almost sounds like uh, check your brain at the door. Just accept what we say. Right. No matter, because the magisterium or the pope or someone said it, and they should know better than you, so they have the right to interpret it over whatever you say. Absolutely. I would venture to say that if you're a Roman Catholic mother or father out there and you've recently uh, had a newborn baby and you've been urged by your parish priest to have that baby baptized, you really don't have an idea of why you did it. You only did it because your priest said to do it. But you could not defend this from the Word of God because the priest can't defend it. He can't defend it because it's not there. But yet it's a tradition, and meaning has been impacted into this tradition to the point where it's accepted, and as you say, uh, the priest says to do it, therefore I do it. Mm -hmm. And sad to say that when the uh, Scripture is brought to bear on this, it absolutely annihilates the concept of uh, efficaciousness or, or uh, forgiveness of sin in the waters of baptism, and it, it certainly annihilates the concept that uh, infants should be baptized. Well, let's take a look at this chart and just see how important these, uh, these sacraments are in a Roman system of salvation. We saw here, if the camera can get in on it, we've got the seven sacraments. The sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for the salvation of mankind. It's from uh, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. You've got the, the seven of them. You've got the baptism, penance, Eucharist, confirmation, holy orders, matrimony, anointing of the sick, or extreme unction. Right. And now coming from one of the highest authorities in the Roman Catholic Church, the General Council of Trent, 7th Session, 1547, Canons of the Sacraments in general. And, of course, this is the consequences right here. Absolutely. If anyone shall say that the sacraments of the new law were not all instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ, or that there are more or fewer than seven, namely baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, is what I just read a minute ago. Uh, any one of these seven is not truly and intrinsically a sacrament, anathema sit, you go to hell. That's is basically it. what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And in part two, if anyone shall say that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary for salvation, but are superfluous, and that without them, or without the desire of them, men obtain from God through Faith alone, and that's what you've been saying, right. you better watch out. The grace of justification through all are not necessary for every individual. Anathema sit. So if you say you're saved by faith alone, that's how you're justified, you you're go to anathema. hell. Right, you are anathema. And well, we've got about a minute to go, brother. Uh, can, you, I know there's not much time. This is a big yeah. subject here. We've kind of well, showed we, the people We started a few the program with the question. What is apologetics? Why are, why are we out there? Why are we even doing this? Why are we involved in uh, making videos and being on the television and, and traveling? It's for these reasons. Thank you very much, Rob. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please be with us next time as we present another program in this series.